My name is Simona Nosmanova, and I would like to welcome you to this uh, ESOF 2020 session about transfer to the industry. I work as a project advisor at the REA Research Executive Agency, and I will have a pleasure to invite four speakers that will be present today. Three of the speakers are representatives of the project, EU funded projects. And um, one uh, speaker will complement our uh, presentation uh, from the perspective of the industry. So um, let's start with my first slide.
Good morning. Uh, once again, we are very sorry for uh, the uh, technical issues we have with the presentations. I would like to invite all the audience, uh, researchers, students, journalists, policymakers, my colleagues and the speakers to send us questions during the next four presentations. And we will try to reply them after uh, every session. And then we will have much more time before the end of the session. When writing us the questions, please don't forget to mention your name and your affiliation. And if you wish, also address the speaker name. I would like to say that what is common for all three projects that will be presented today. They have been managed by the project managers who have successfully applied for the EU grant under Horizon 2020 Marie Skodowska Kiri Action Research and Innovation Staff Exchange. They have been successfully running the projects that serve for exchanges between researchers within the Europe, but also beyond. It's very important that in these projects, the researchers will develop their skills, their knowledge, and build their career. So what have been these projects doing? Let's start with the first project of Mr. Erwin Rauch from the University of Bolzano, who will tell us more about the project SME 4.0. Erwin, the floor is yours. The floor is yours. So thank you, Simona, for the nice introduction and welcome all of you to my presentation about the project SME 4.0. So in the next 10, 15 minutes, I want to explain to you how we uh, conducted our research in order to facilitate uh, small and medium sized enterprises to introduce industry 4.0 in their companies. But before Speaking about the project, let's start with some uh, general expectations that companies have from Industry 4.0. And here we can list up uh, several points like uh, the increase of productivity on the shop floor to adapt uh, the manufacturing systems in a way that they, they are reconfigurable, that they are modular, flexible, and uh, also agile. We want also to increase our sustainability in sense of economic, ecological, as well as also social sustainability in manufacturing. Of course, we want to also use new technologies, maybe new technologies uh, that are data related and therefore they help us to predict things that are happening in the future, therefore to foresee also uh, if a machine will break down in the future. So using also predictive technologies and to automate routine tasks uh, through systems like advanced robotics, uh, autonomous robotics in a certain sense of flexible automation. So all of this uh, might be quite easy for the larger enterprises that have also the financial resources, the research departments and so on, the, the size of doing it by their own. But what about the small and medium sized enterprises? It might not be so easy for them. Therefore, looking also a little bit into the history and the timeline of Industry for Zero from the foundation in 2011 on the Hanover Fair, we see that it took some time, several years, three, four years, five years, until the term was clarified, until we had also a clear vision of the key technologies, a start in the several, in, in, the, in the different countries of Europe also to start with some national plans for uh, facilitating industry companies to use these technologies, but there was no clear focus on the smaller ones. And we know that in, especially in Europe, the small and medium sized enterprises are the backbone of the European economy. So we are quite proud also to have been the first large EU project focusing on exactly this fact, how to introduce industry for zero in the smaller uh, enterprises. So I, want to give you an overview also about our project that we called SME 4.0. Uh, it has a volume of around about 1 million of euro with the EU funding of uh, 780,000 euro. We as University of Bolzano are the project coordinator of this interesting consortium consisting of eight partners from six different countries coming from Europe, from United States, as well as also from Asia. 
the project duration is four years as typical for the Mercury Rise projects. And in this project, we involved more than 40, uh, 45 researchers in total. What about the objectives of our project? So first, we wanted to know what are the needs of the uh, SMEs and what are also enablers, but also what are the barriers for SMEs in order to introduce industry for zero in their uh, organizations. Then we wanted to create uh, demonstrators and technical solutions that are adapted for the smaller uh, enterprises. And the third objective was to develop also organizational and business models, how they can uh, set up an industry for zero vision roadmap, and then also all the tools for introducing industry for zero in their companies. A uh, short look about the project consortium to present also our partners. So in Europe, we work together as University of Bolzano with the Montana University of Leoben in Austria, with the Technical University in Kozice in Slovakia. And we had also a small and medium sized uh, enterprise on board, which is Alcom from uh, Slovakia. And we have a uh, uh, big uh, exchange of knowledge and of uh, research uh, with other partners from international countries like the WPI, MIT from United States and the Chiang Mai University from Thailand and Sachs Engineering College from India to uh, mention also the partners from Asia. So all this led to a really fruitful and wonderful experience for all of us, especially the young researchers in our groups, to uh, visit also other places, to visit also small and medium-sized enterprises in the United States, in different countries of Europe, in Asia, and therefore to work together on solutions and on methods how to uh, deal with this big challenge of introducing industry for zero in the smaller companies. So we were uh, really happy to have this uh, experience and this opportunity to work all together on all over the world. What are the research fields where we work together? Uh, we had three research fields, which are manufacturing, logistics, and organization and management models. And here, for example, for manufacturing and logistics, we had some subtopics dealing with uh, adaptability, with uh, smart supply chains, with how to introduce uh, cyber physical systems in these two areas, as well as also how to automate processes in manufacturing and in logistics. While the research field in organization and management models was much more focused on uh, business models for smart SMEs, on organization network models, as well as also finally on uh, providing tools and strategies to become such a uh, smart, sm small and medium sized enterprise. So some words also about the methodology that we used. We wanted to hear the voice, let's say, of the customer in sense of the voice of the small and medium-sized industries to work on these topics. Therefore, we organized in United States and Italy, Austria, as well as also in Thailand for uh, workshops where we work together with 37 SMEs in total, therefore roughly 10 participating companies for each workshop. We uh, gave an introduction into the basic concepts of Industry for Zero. We showed also best practice examples, and then we discussed together with them uh, about the needs, about the barriers, and about their, in general, the uh, what they need to uh, have from our project in order to uh, introduce in the next four co forthcoming years these new emerging technologies in their companies. And this is the way how I want to proceed you also in uh, giving you an overview of the results that we have uh, uh, achieved in this project. So we uh, see here in the objective one, therefore the identification of the needs and the barriers. You see here the list of the top barriers that are hindering or where the SMEs have problems also with introduction of industry for zero, which is training qualification, which is also the employee acceptance to ex accept something new 
uh, that is coming into the company. Also the lack of financial resources, a lack in know-how of how to digitalize, a lack also in knowledge about new industry for zero technologies like augmented reality or virtual reality uh, or also simulation. In a certain sense also that they need a better data security because the world is becoming uh, much more data oriented. So we have also to be uh, safe with our data that we produce or that we manage in our companies. And last but not least, also the lack of tools how to implement this industry for zero technologies in the companies. On the next step, you see here the main needs that SMEs have. So the first point is on getting in touch with industry for zero technologies, because uh, they wanted also to use them, to test them, to have something to, to understand, is this something useful for my company? Therefore, we develop pilot cases with some uh, SMEs in our network, and we uh, developed also industry for zero demonstrators. Afterwards, we will see two of them. The next point was also that they had no clear idea what are the what is the complete picture of industry for zero so we provided a catalog with 42 concepts and technologies where they can select what are the most suitable for uh, each of the companies then practically oriented qualification of the stuff so we uh, set it up here uh, learning factory labs and we provided seminars and trainings for SMEs in order that they can qualify their stuff and then you see the last two points, we worked also on methods and tools and how to digitalize the business models, working on industry for zero assessments and the road mapping model, as well as also a readiness model for digital business models. So this is about this first objective in our project needs and barriers. And in a second point, I uh, explained also that we worked out demonstrators and technical solutions adapted for the SMEs. So that's objective two in our project. And here I want to show you two examples. The first example is on how to integrate collaborative robotics in smaller companies. This is a very useful technology because now the smaller companies that mainly use manual processes have a flexible way how to automate uh, also their processes, having a hybrid solution where people are working together with robots. For doing this, they, we developed not only this lab demonstrator, but also the methodology, how a typical SME can evaluate also how to convert such a manual assembly line into, for example, a collaborative one. And we provided also product design guidelines because uh, such kind of uh, process has also a certain impact on how to do the design of products in the future. And we applied uh, this concept in different SME case studies with some case studies in the United States, uh, Europe, as well as also in Thailand. A second example is uh, cyber physical systems where we uh, developed a demonstrator that shows also how we can uh, deal with digital twins, therefore to test things on the digital model before we spend the first euro, for example, also for building up the physical model. And how to use technologies like RFID or computer vision in order to do uh, automated quality control, checking if the geometry of parts is okay, or if the item completeness is given, when we have a certain assembly cycle. And also here we used case studies with SMEs in order to prove that what we have, uh, um, that what we have uh, uh, demonstrated in the laboratory. This was where two examples from objective two, and it's the sense of demonstrators. So now let's come to the objective three, to the more organizational uh, methods and tools. And here you see an overview of the roadmap that we developed for small and medium-sized enterprises. So a quite easy to understand roadmap where in the first step, we concentrate on the awareness building of employees and qualification. In the second step, we define together with the SME their requ individual requirements and constraints. And afterwards in step three and four, you see 
the self-assessment and the analysis of the gap from the current status to a target status, as well as also the potential of industry for zero concepts. This is something that I will explain in a next slide in more detail, where we developed a, a tool for that. And finally, in the last step of this roadmap, uh, we have to define, of course, the implementation plan and here to prioritize and select what is the most strategic point that needs to be implemented. But here, let's go to the next slide where I show a little bit more about this industry for zero assessment tool where the SMEs, and we had here a network of 28 SMEs that participated in the first try to uh, assess their current status, to define a target status, and to assess also the importance of, or the potential of all the 42 industry for zero concepts that we defined at the beginning. And finally, this gives also an interesting overview in this norm strategy matrix that we see on the right side, where uh, also small companies can find in a very easy way what are the technologies or concepts that are bringing quick wins to the company, therefore they can be implemented in one year or two years, and what are maybe also other concepts that are must-haves, they are important, but you need more time, more effort, more perhaps also financial resources to get them, and therefore they be, need to be included in a long-term digitalization vision or strategy of the company. So, Having seen these results and these free research objectives, I want to show you also how we work together with the SMEs. Therefore, we uh, follow these free concepts to present, demonstrate, and then to apply what we have done. Therefore, to participate in events and fairs, organizing trainings and visits in our laboratories, and then uh, getting also the contact to these SMEs in order to apply all these concepts in the first pilot applications and in projects together with these smaller companies. That's from the practical side, from the, let's say, more theoretical side. We worked also, of course, here on the transfer of knowledge and the dissemination to researchers, but also to the, to the uh, small and medium-sized companies, publishing free books, uh, the, uh, first book is a special issue book. The second one is more on the related or uh, focused for researchers, while the third book is more uh, focusing on examples, applications, and therefore the target audience is there much more the uh, in the the enterprise itself. We organized also events for with and for industry, uh, and we are very proud also about the results in having achieved or having received eight awards for scientific results. These were best paper awards, these were young researcher awards, these were uh, uh, a lot of uh, awards also for the younger researcher in our group, and that's something where we are very proud of it. With this, I want to come also to the last slide and therefore to conclude this presentation. So in the last four years, we have taken many steps towards this goal of achieving a smart SME factory. So we identified the requirements, we demonstrated how it works, we provided tools and methods for the implementation. Now that's what we want to do in the next year, in the last year of our project is to concentrate on the knowledge transfer and to pilot applications in SMEs, therefore in this transfer uh, are from research into practice. And in the medium long term uh, perspective, our consortium will go on when working together and we want to work much more on the topic of how to introduce also the artificial intelligence applications in the small and medium sized companies. So with this, I conclude my presentation. If there are any questions also after this presentation, here you see also my contact details and you can contact me or some of my colleagues from the project for, uh, for questions. Uh, and uh, then I thank you for the attention and I'm here available for questions from the audience. Thank you. Dear Erwin, thank you so much for sharing with our audience the uh, actually progress of your project because it's still ongoing. 
and uh, also the intermediate results. And I would like to ask you a question. Uh, you have mentioned that you have been collaborating with the ex SMEs uh, across the continents and um, how to introduce the Industry 4.0. And so I would like to know, did you find any differences or similarities? We expected them, to, or we expected to have uh, different situations in the free continents, also because there we had a situation with uh, uh, high wage countries, uh, middle and low wage countries. But at the end, if we uh, see it from a perspective of the structural problems or the basic problems, they were always the same. That the smaller companies they have not the money, not the people, not the knowledge to introduce this these concepts or these technologies, and therefore we saw a lot of similarities, perhaps on different levels or on different topics. Maybe that uh, Europe or in Europe and the United States we are much more focusing on topics like robotics in order to automate the the physical work, uh, while in uh, Asia uh, we have seen there's a lot of focus also on software applications and how we can digitalize processes and uh, here we saw the most of the, the differences but basically uh, we had a very balanced and similar uh, perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution Erwin. So I would like to move to the next speaker now. Uh, I would like to introduce to our audience Professor Lisa De Propris. She is the principal investigator of another uh, Horizon 2020 uh, Mariskudovska Key Reaction Rice project. Uh, which is called Markers. Thank you very much for this invitation to present at this uh, Ease of 2020 conference. Um, as I was into, th thank you for a very kind introduction. I coordinated in Horizon uh, 2020 project called Makers, uh, which actually ended up it finished in uh, 2019. It was a three year project. As the title suggests, we were very keen to explore, especially in those first, first years, the implications and the disruptions that Industry 4.0 could have on the economy. This is a project very much uh, placed within social sciences. Uh, it lasted 36 months, it really involved 35 researchers. Um, we had uh, almost 200 months of secondments, uh, produced a number of reports. Uh, not a lot of publications have come out not least uh, uh, recently the uh, open access book called Industry 4.0 Regional Transformations. You can access the book free of charge or you can buy the hard copy, unfortunately uh, paying a price. The project was very ambitious then because it really uh, started to uh, explore what Industry 4.0 really meant. What we knew so until at that point was really a definition which, we, which was very much driven by the German uh, policy debate. So the idea was to create a pool of multidisciplinary researchers that could study really how manufacturing will change or is going to change due to new technologies. As you can see, the idea of developing a new manufacturing model was the anchor of a number of themes from looking at knowledge transfer, we looked at reshoring, and already then in 2017-18, we started to see deglobalization uh, uh, showing uh, signs of uh, emerging following the financial crisis in 2008. Then we looked at global value chains, we looked at skills, and we looked at systems. The project really was um, pivoting around the, uh, the, the the changes that the new technologies would have brought in. As Erwin introduced, there are there's a wave of new technologies coming in. Some of these, like ICT or AI or robotics, they're very much um, they will very much drive efficiency and cost reduction within factories, uh, becoming making factories smoother, more flexible, more adaptable, um, and of course. Uh, it will have an impact on employment. 
However, we stressed in the project as well, there are other technologies coming in which are much more linked to uh, a, a, the, the opportunity that we have to really reconcile growth with long-term sustainable development. Until now, there has been a huge debate about trade-off between growth and, and the environment. I think we try in the project to, to, to raise awareness that this, this trade-off possibly can be uh, overcome. We are at this point in time in the middle of this massive technological change. We use theories of innovation to explain that we are at the end of a technological crisis where basically current technologies are declining. They're slowly becoming less relevant. New technologies are coming in, but of course with an element of resistance. What are they for? What life, what difference will it make to my life? And of course, as Erwin just said, what difference will they make to firms, smaller firms, larger firms? And also, there is a, 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 we had a, a, an important uh, um, theme on labor, because of course, one of the big changes will be how will talent, uh, 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 will, how will talent be, have to be changed in order to accommodate this kind of co-working with, with, with robots? So we are at, time, at times of changes, so we are in the middle of a shock. And this somehow is uh, uh, something that is particularly felt by, by firms more than consumers who are quite excited about probably new products coming in. We were very, uh, within the, the project, we, we were, you know, we, we had 11 uh, um, academic uh, partners, we had eight non-academic partners, and as we were developing, uh, uh, engaging with events, conversations, it became very clear that just a definition of Industry 4.0 that was looking at efficiency was not very satisfactory for, the, for, for us. And we tried to push this a bit further by trying to define Industry 4.0 in a kind of different way. And we call it Industry 4.0 Plus. Uh, the idea is that, unfortunately, the, the term is so common knowledge now that it's very difficult to kind of reinvent the wheel. But the idea was that we need to really think about what the changes will be. So the, uh, the uh, new um, fourth industrial revolution technologies will really transform what we call the tech economic paradigm, that it's the foundation of our economic system. When we speak with businesses, they were incredibly curious about what was going on. Larger firms, you know, like Siemens, for example, we spoke with large firms in uh, uh, ABB in Sweden, they know what's going on, they've been driving the debate. But as soon as you go one tier down or two tier down and you have these small firms really trying to grapple with the change, you find firms slightly more scared, slightly more unsure about what will the change be, how much will it cost, what will it entail. And when we were trying to unpack what does Industry 4.0 means for the economy and for, and for sectors, we really looked at five angles. The creation of new markets, the creation let me just move to maybe to the next slide. New markets, new products. For example, a big example that we really used in our project is we must move away from plastic. There is a technology now for bio-based materials which can replace plastic. This was something that we worked with our partners in Sweden. Vinova was one of our partners together with um, a number of small firms that were located in the in the area uh, uh, around Stockholm. And with them, it became very clear that the bio economy is something that is happening and it can really change completely the products we use them in a sustainable way, but also for firms in a competitive way, providing also a profit stream. Also this idea of product service innovation, the civitization a trend is still ongoing. People don't want to buy things anymore. They want to hire them. What this will mean for businesses is a change in the business model. Now, COVID at the moment is a little bit undermining this model, but this phase, this trend is actually still quite strong. New business models and, of course, last but not least, the idea of new uh, customer-centered innovation. Uh, in speaking with pharmaceutical companies, we realize even, for example, medicines will be customized. People will not just have the normal milligrams, but they will be made to satisfy um, the, the individual uh, patient based on age, gender, ethnicity, or, for example, weight. Now, 
the disruption is at multi levels, and we looked at disrupting firms. We tried to understand how firms can move from being laggard, resisting the change, hiding under a stone a little bit, becoming learner, adopters, but also the shapers. And of course, the shapers are the big firms. The big multinational are playing a massive role, and they are the one driving the debate within the supply chain. And in fact, the next important disruption level is, of course, sectorism. Um, we looked at, for example, one of the many sectors we looked at was automotive. The shift from uh, uh, petrol, oil-based cars to electric cars is going to transform completely the value chain, increasing, um, expanding the, 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 the need for new types of suppliers, not just simply a components maker, but a lot of these firms, if you look in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this map, most of the suppliers will be in service-based products. So disrupting firms also is leading, is led or is leading, the, the two things are very much linked, by the disruption that technologies are having at the sector level. But of course, these sectors are underpinned but supply chains. And when we are looking at the supply chains, what we need to realize is that they are located in particular places. So sectors, for example, we've got automotive clusters in north of Italy, we've got aerospace in France, we've got uh, uh, mechanical engineering in Germany. These industries are very much locally based. So the decision at the local level are very much linked with decision at the national level. And of course, within the EU, there is a very strong leadership in terms of industrial and regional policy and technology policy at the European level. Being based within social sciences, the project really tackled how to inform policymakers of the changes which are happening. And so we were very keen to engage with businesses, but also with policymakers, because businesses at this point in time, we feel cannot be left alone. These are times where the changes are so big, the businesses need leadership, they need a vision, they need funding, but also they need to know which technologies they need, because their awareness to technologies is led maybe within the value chain by the buyers, but also a lot by what they hear on the grapevine, what it's happening, what policymakers are pushing forwards through uh, through national and regional level uh, initiatives. So we came up with what we what we define a transformative in our innovation matrix. What this means is that when we see the technologies coming through the system, this impacts on sectors and supply chains. These are located in special in, in specific places. So we cannot basically ignore the regional implication of technological change. It could well be that if some regions, some clusters are uh, resisting the change, their opportunities for development might be hampered. I think we are at a, 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 at a junction. And in a sense, all these technologies will transform radically the economy. They will transform radical sectors and therefore somehow also businesses. And those who are not engaging in this change will eventually, uh, naturally, in a, in a kind of an organic way, becomes obsolete. But the national level policy is very important by providing vision, target, but also institutional framework. For example, having in place uh, uh, connections that enable universities to connect with businesses. Now, uh, more, than, uh, more than ever, uh, businesses have to connect with universities where knowledge is coming from, where we see the importance of technologies emerging and their, their transformation into application has to be happening in collaboration with firms. And so university and, and businesses collaborating now is going to be a crucial, a crucial point. Of course, it will disrupt uh, value chains. We had a, a big theme looking at uh, the uh, at reshoring, looking at the impact of offshoring, the deindustrialization of, of a lot of European regions now um, is a huge problem because, of course, these regions uh, need to find new ways of, of uh, uh, having viable economies. And again, we see this technology offering an opportunity 
for reinventing manufacturing in a way that is compatible with Europe being a high cost, high skill economy. Um, we looked at how uh, from global value chains, we uh, increasingly see a, a debate that it's shifting uh, uh, firms looking at continental production platforms. So multinational firms, for example, locating in China now, not to be then shifting stuff back to Europe, but action for the Asian market. So we see increasingly this new trend in terms of deglobalization, the continental scale of production becoming uh, quite fashionable. This is very early stage and we had um, uh, a couple of studies on this with the very interesting uh, uh, results. The project really involved the policymakers, firms, uh, large firms, smaller firms uh, um, across uh, uh, different countries. We have partners in Europe, uh, um, but also uh, with California in the US and, uh, and Singapore in, in Asia. The project was very much based within advanced economies because we're looking at the implications of new technologies for advanced manufacturing. So we chose the only, we think, Asian economy, uh, which is uh, uh, classified as an advanced economy, which is, of course, uh, Singapore. So we looked at case studies in, in Italy, Sweden, France, UK, US and Switzerland. Our work with Singapore was mostly driven by the partner who is uh, really very much looking into, into uh, the, the, the um, globalization and uh, uh, global value chains. As you can see also, we looked at a number of sectors. Some are more technologically intensive than others. Uh, uh, some are traditional sectors like, for example, textile. And this gave us a breadth of evidence to show that all sectors are actually uh, uh, um, impacted on by these new technologies. The case studies enabled us to engage with private and public stakeholders, uh, small firms and multinational firms, but also, as I said, policymakers, regional, uh, local and national governments. We collected information, data, views, um, and we delivered uh, through our uh, um, um, dissemination events, but also our dialogue. We very much felt that our di uh, dissemination events were open conversations. Uh, we raised awareness. I mean, in some countries, we really found that some of our initial contacts were they were asking questions rather than we actually asking them. They were really keen to know more about this. So we raised awareness, we informed, but also we revealed at the end of the project, we shared our findings to see whether they, they, they could be validated by policymakers and by um, firms. Um, we have uh, the final kind of theme was a wrapping up theme around policy. So by uh, address, addressing policy concern, listening to businesses, but also dialoguing com constantly with regional and national and EU stakeholders, we came up with a number of policy recommendations, uh, um, which we think are going to somehow uh, make a huge difference in the way in, uh, in which uh, businesses can and must adapt. First of all, uh, businesses cannot be left alone. Businesses are very much, we felt, uh, uh, especially medium and, and small size firms, very much lost in the process and they need to be supported. So public and private financial support for the adoption of these technologies is very important. Skills and capacity building. We did a, a, a very interesting work on, on, on uh, trying to understand whether businesses could hire the skills that they need and the answer was no. There's an increased demand for uh, digital talent, people who have understanding of programming, uh, dealing with big data, and these are really skills that are very scarce in the current in the current uh, uh, situation. Of course, this means somehow probably redefine smart specialization. European Union is very much uh, uh, still um, anchored around the, the theme of, of uh, smart specialization. The very important additional point that needs to be looked at is that regions have not just to transform slowly, it's not going to be an incremental change. Some of these changes will be very disruptive and supporting the disruption is a very important role for policy. Uh, also, uh, we found that the importance of having digital infrastructure, 5G is one of them, for example, especially in remote areas, for example, in, in Sweden, 
uh, uh, or in, in, in a quite remote countryside area. For example, if access to 4G is a problem. So if we want to digitalize work and digitalize our economies, these needs to be sorted out. These are kind of the uh, uh, bread and butter of, of, of the fourth industrial revolution. And finally, of course, is to support firms in becoming ready, ready to embrace, ready to adapt, ready to change, and see this as an opportunity. At the moment, many firms see this as a challenge, um, as a threat. They don't see this as an opportunity. And somehow this mindset has to shift. And probably uh, at the moment, of course, everybody's quite um, you know, d distracted or very uh, concerned about COVID, but uh, uh, the, the, the change is very imminent and the, 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 the urgency to ensure the businesses are still thinking about embracing these new technologies uh, uh, is very, very important. The project uh, is as a website, which is called, which is Makers, and is still active. And if you're interested in any of the things I've been talking about, please visit the project or you can access online uh, free of charge our book thank you very much and looking forward to your answer to your questions dear lisa thank you so much for your input for your nice presentation especially for stressing out the importance of cooperation between business and academia which is actually the grow the core team of rice action so we hope that uh, this will continue also not only in eu funded projects but on all national levels and european levels and global levels i would like to ask you a question that is probably related to the last slide you have presented to us and i would like to ask did you find that businesses were on top of the technological change that was crashing on their industries? Um, we found that uh, larger firms, um, they were kind of really driving the debate and media, the first year suppliers were starting to understand the change because of course, the OEMs were started to communicate the change. But very small firms, uh, they maybe have heard about it when they go to you know, a coffee or breakfast meeting at the Chamber of Commerce, uh, but they, were very much um, they were asking question. So I don't mm -hmm. think smaller firms, uh, what was quite interesting to listen to what Irvin was saying, because smaller firms uh, don't have the capacity. Some of them are very busy with their daily work and they don't have the capacity to, to really fully understand what's going on. And the opportunities that they have, sometimes they're missed because they're too busy trying to meet some deadlines. So I try to engage smaller firms. I think it's gonna be a priority for maintaining healthy and competitive value chains in Europe. Thank you, Lisa, for your reply. Thank you so much. And uh, for our audience, you will have more time to ask questions at the end uh, of this panel session. And I would like now to move to our third speaker, uh, Professor Anne Laura Menchen. Uh, she is a principal investigator of the Open Inno Train, also the RISE project. Professor Anlor Menchen is the director of the Global Business Innovating Enabling Capability Platform at Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. And she will speak about the Research and Innovation Staff Exchange Scheme and the second lens as a very effective instrument actually to achieve a research translation and change researchers' attitude and behavior towards industry cooperation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and it's really a pleasure to be here today to present our uh, progress uh, with the Open Inno Train project. And it, it's great to be the third speaker. As, uh, there's been a there's been an excellent segue uh, to the topic, both by Erwin and then Lisa and and uh, Simona. 
uh, especially when, when Lisa commented that it's very important that uh, businesses connect with universities um, um, to tap into the, the pool of knowledge that is available there. And my point will be with this presentation that universities also need to connect with businesses, also the other way around. And that's really the core focus of, of what Open Innotrain is. So I'd like um, first to um, give you a bit of context and rationales where we, why we, we came up with this project. Um, first of all, I would say there's a, a little bit of the policy push or the policy context and the very influential report by the European Commission in 2015 on open innovation, open science, open to the world, which emphasized, well, a lot of different elements, but I, I'll pick up the ones that are the most relevant for us. The fact that um, too rarely is Europe uh, successful in getting research results to the market and that uh, so far there's still way too many uh, of its technologies that are commercialized elsewhere. The second aspect is that the way research is, is being conducted nowadays is, is more and more open, is more and more collaborative and participative and COVID has certainly uh, further emphasized that. And the last aspect is that um, EU still punches below its weight when it comes to international science and innovation. Uh, I'd like also to put that into the context of the recently released European Innovation Scoreboard, which uh, positions EU in, in quite a strong place and we uh, keep uh, improving our position at a steady pace. So uh, obviously progress differs across different countries and we are still lagging behind and losing ground vis-a-vis uh, -vis Australia, Japan, Korea. So um, that, that's roughly the context uh, in combination to the fact that universities have been changing. Uh, you've heard about the third mission, which is the increased importance of technology transfer or more broadly engagement of universities with multiple stakeholders, including civil society, and ensure that the research that is being conducted within universities has an impact. Um, in the UK, there's a REF framework for the assessment of that, and, and it is something that is uh, now increasingly widespread on a global level. So our Open Innotrain project exactly sits at that uh, nexus of open innovation, university industry cooperation as a specific mechanism to implement open innovation and research translation as a powerful concept to actually convert and implement um, the research outputs to, to solve societal challenges. So we see uh, research translation as a prerequisite for um, social impact. And we also see it as a broader concept than, than um, lots of the parallel ones, such as technology, transfer knowledge, transfer knowledge exchange, research valorization, research commercializations, and the likes, which most of them have um, some monetary perspective to it. And, and we really feel that research translation is, is more encompassing, and it also allows to cater for non-monetary aspects, which can be very important, especially when we're talking about the social sciences disciplines, where most of the research outputs tend to be intangible in nature. So it's obviously um, a research and innovation stack exchange project. So we aim to build and sustain a network, an intersectoral international network of organization. And we, we um, aim to do some theory development, conduct multiple case studies, and obviously transfer the knowledge that has been um, developed within the project to, to stakeholders and, and more broadly to civil society. We started the project early 2019. So we're about 18 months in the project. And you can imagine that the last six months, we've been pretty much on a pose uh, like everyone else. Um, so we are still in the um, early stage of the project. Project, uh, but I'll be reporting here on, on the first um, preliminary insights uh, that we've gathered through the project. We um, obviously aimed, we, we are probably one of the largest um, EU funded projects. We've uh, initially foreseen 540 person months and um, counting. <laughs> and uh, we do plan uh, quite a lot of events in terms of master classes, workshops, seminars, hackathons, summer schools, and strengths. Uh, which uh, you might be less familiar with, which is uh, about student researchers and, and managers interacting with a practitioner laying out what a problem is, a, an academic view on that problem, and then students being involved in, in problem solving and, and offering multiple solutions. Um, obviously, what we aim to deliver is 
uh, a substantial set of academic outputs, but also uh, to put in place some structural collaboration mechanisms to ensure the sustainability of the project. So some of those could be, for example, industrial PhDs and um, public-private partnerships, and um, obviously actionable knowledge, because that's very much at the core of what this project is about. So we've, um, this is the structure we've, we've selected for Open in a Train. Um, we obviously start with the core competencies development and the upskilling of both our researchers, but also um, thought leaders and innovation managers and practitioners involved in the project. And then we uh, customize and contextualize that knowledge in, uh, by applying to four key um, sectors, fintech, industry 4.0, clean tech, and food technologies, which have been chosen because of their relevance and significance for the European economy. I mean, it's uh, no news to you that, for example, the food tech is, is particularly crucial uh, due to the fact that it, it applies advanced technologies to produce, package, but also distribute food, which is a, a key element of, of food security. We have, um, obviously, a communication dissemination and implementation work package which uh, looks um, into how we can resonate, um, how we can integrate and resonate our findings with leading associations or leading organizations such as the Digital Innovation Hub and, and uh, build synergies in that project and beyond that project. We are a consortium of um, over 20 partners, as you can see, and we have adopted an ecosystems approach in the project. So usually we have multiple stakeholders uh, in the same country. So for example, in, in Finland, we've got uh, the largest uh, Nordic clean tech cluster with an SME, a Reg Innovation Oil, Marinova as a tech transfer office and the University of Basel. Just to clarify maybe a little bit the positioning of what we're doing, we, we combine different streams, uh, theoretical streams. The first one being obviously the university industry cooperation literature, which has been burgeoning over the last 40 years or so with uh, subsequent waves of uh, debates, enrichments and delights, and, and more recently questioning about the use of platforms and technologies to actually achieve that knowledge transfer, knowledge exchange and the brokerage of knowledge. Uh, we obviously rely on the Open Innovation Framework as, as defined by Henry Chepo and also on all the streams that relate to knowledge sharing, knowledge sourcing, um, uh, focusing more on individual level interaction. So that's a social sciences project in itself, but we obviously apply it very much uh, to topics that are in the tech economy. So that I guess that resonates also very well with, with this new logic of um, shape. Um, so social sciences, humanities, and the arts for people and the economy or people in, and the environment. So I'm not going to go into all those details, otherwise we're going to be running out of time. But what I want to say is that we, we really look into unpacking the conversion process from research outputs to research outcomes to research impacts. So these are the topics that the, the second Ds are working on. Lots of them work at individual levels, so really opening the black box and understanding behaviors, understanding traits and attitudes, what really motivates individuals to cooperate, how can we incentivize them to be part of a university uh, industry cooperation project, but also what are at um, organizational level the mechanisms that we need to put in place for that to happen, including HR-related mechanisms, but also intellectual property mechanisms. And because we, we've um, we've observed that different settings are very different. So fintech is obviously not clean tech or industry 4.0 or food tech. And it also represents different realities in terms of the, the size of the companies involved, but also the very nature of the research that is being produced in those settings. That, that's what I summarize by the variations in the inputs. We also have to really unpack that translation process, which, which looks into this conversion between inputs to outputs and further around to, to solutions, so which could be products, processes, services, and the fact that those are being um, uptaken by organizations um, to create some impact, which can be environmental, economic, health-related, or even more broadly social impact. So that's, um, that's where we're coming from, and, um, and that's um, 
One thing that I'd like to highlight as well with this slide is that we, we don't see that translation process as a linear one, but, but very much as an iterative one. And, and that's what the case study so far has have also been unveiling. So the, don't, don't see that arrow as a linear thing. It's, it's just a streamlining approach to, to summarizing this. So we've obviously, we've obviously uh, mapped the different organizational forms of university industry uh, cooperation for research translation, and, and the project so far has been focusing mainly on the three uh, pillars that sit in the middle, so the formal mechanisms to cooperate, including industrial PhDs, so we've been setting up industrial PhDs, and at the same time monitoring what's the outcome of those, so, and, and it's obviously still a work in progress. But that's where it's very interesting because we, we're doing, we're implementing the measure, but at the same time, we're sort of reflecting on it and seeing how we can improve it and what kind of mechanisms we, we can put in place for further developments. We've, we've worked quite a lot as well on uh, the medium pillar uh, around intermediary interventions and more specifically the role of technological brokers and the role of network orchestrators. Um, uh, put it very broadly, so it could be clusters or it could be regional technology transfer networks. Um, collaborative research projects are also on the agenda, and some of the research is, is conducted at that level um, in, in some of the work packages. Uh, for the sake of time, I might just give um, a little bit of insight into a couple of um, cases that are going on, but more as um, illustration. So in the fintech space, for example, we've looked into uh, the role of regulatory sandboxes. And um, if you're not familiar with a regulatory sandbox, just think about a regular sound kit, because this is really what it is. It's about developing novelties and then piloting them, testing them, but within very safe boundaries. So um, startups that do develop those uh, novelties or universities that, that contribute to the knowledge uh, generated and, and transferred into those companies actually operate in, in, in an environment which is very safe and, and uh, which obviously allows to, to mitigate uh, systemic risk. So uh, we've been looking into regulatory sandboxes as, as an instrument to foster innovation and to foster this university industry cooperation. And, and again, working mainly at the individual level and, and looking into social interactions between the different stakeholders, uh, whether it is the regulators, but also obviously the universities, the startups, um, and um, the multiple companies, including the, the banking sector or the financial services firms, and, and eventually the recipients, usually the end users as well. So that's, um, that's uh, for the fintech illustration. Uh, when it comes to the Industry 4.0 and clean tech case studies, um, this, this is uh, a bit more of a work in progress. Um, so we, we are looking more specifically into the VASA Innovation Center, which has been designed to foster that university industry collaboration. That's, so that, that, that's a great instrument to, to observe how um, it, is, um, it is actually operating and how it is fostering those um, cooperation mechanisms and, and to what extent um, its role is evolving across time. So when the cooperation is already happening, what kind of skills, what kind of expertise, what kind of support is being provided and how does that differ according to the maturity of the relationship between the different partners. In the food tech space, it, re it really has, um, sits at the and intersection between Industry 4.0, agri-tech, and clean technologies. And, and uh, we're very lucky to observe um, um, clusters of companies working in cooperation with the University of Siena and, and some of other local stakeholders, such as a, a wine, um, wine, wine association in Montepulciano. So more results on that soon, as, as it is um, obviously a work in progress. But it's, it's a set of very innovative technologies that are being applied to mainly to, to the production of, of um, organic wine and um, that are also meant to sort of streamline the production processes and, uh, and allow those companies to, to scale up. Part of the project is also really focused into raising awareness of researchers and, and hopefully changing the mindset of researchers over time. That uh, thinking about impact is something that you need to start doing upfront. It's not something that you do once you have your research results and then just sort of wonder what to do with them. So uh, we've developed a set of tools and, and that toolbox includes, for example, the Lean Research Translation Canvas. 
if you're familiar with the business model canvas, um, you probably recognize the similarities. And, and this is really an instrument that is meant to be um, a guidance for researchers to, to think upfront about what their research will be delivering and who is going to be impacted by that and how can this impact be actually increased and, and catalyzed. So we, we're running events, so we've run a few of those um, so far, and more are foreseen. You can see all of them on, on the Open in Train website, and, and they're open to everyone to attend in general. In the approach that we're taking in, in most of um, the, the, the works that we're doing is that we're having focus groups, and then we're having um, industry uh, experts um, gatherings, and also, um, obviously, data collection through interviews and surveys, and we're presenting at the results, but also interacting and collecting data through various events um, in the innovation community, but more broadly in the, the different tech application areas, in the group tech industry 4.0 and clean tech. I, I just would like to conclude by saying that um, a RISE project can only be successful uh, thanks and through the second Ds. Um, so we, we make a point in collecting the voice of the second Ds and, and also um, trying to understand how um, this second month is actually impacting the career path. In this very specific case, it's a bit too early to say, but what I can tell is that Pauline has had a very insightful experience being in Australia when the pandemic struck. Um, but, but obviously we, we, we do want to acknowledge and, and, um, and thank all those second Ds for all the effort they're putting in order to build those connections, connect with industry, but also um, experience uh, things that are totally different than their business as usual. So more experiences can be can be seen and read on the open in our train at EU researchers uh, website. And I'd like to conclude and thank you for your um, thank you for listening and I'm very welcome to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Analor, for your presentation and uh, also for uh, um, giving the actually testimonials of the researchers who have been uh, seconded during <clears throat> during your project. And I would like to ask you uh, a question related to the core uh, topic of your project. And uh, would you would you be able to tell our tell, tell our audience? Is research translation an area of interest and of a concern of all types of companies and for all universities? I would say probably not to everyone yet in terms of is it an area of interest and concern? Probably not yet, but it should certainly be. So I think the ones for whom it is not yet an area of interest just need to have the right kick and the right level of awareness to understand that it is important. I think in the university sector, the importance is, is is gaining traction, is growing every day, and the, the frameworks that assess the university's performance are there to testify that it is getting more important every day. And I think from the side of companies, it's, it's a matter of uh, aligning expectations and having clarity on, on um, how the, the university cooperation can work. Um, but usually, as soon as it, it works well, it's a starting point for further collaboration. That's, that's this logic of um, gaining in maturity in collaboration activities. Thank you so much. And it's now my pleasure to uh, give a floor to the last speaker of our panel, a representative of an industry leading company in Industry 4.0, Mr. Giuseppe Biffi. Mr. Giuseppe Biffi is a digitalization business development manager for digitalization at Siemens SPA. And almost all of his professional life, he was dedicated to automatization, automation, pardon, from software to hardware, from product business to solution business, from delivery to sales in small and large companies. Mr. Biffy, the floor is... Okay, good morning uh, everyone, also from my side. Uh, thank you, Simona, for your nice introduction. Um, my goal uh, in this uh, last presentation uh, is uh, basically to offer you a point of view of a company, uh, which is, I think is pretty well known, uh, um, but the point of view is not only from a technology provider, but also I would like to report to you uh, the point of view of our customers and partners 
that we daily work with, and also the point of view of our user, because Siemens is also a user of uh, his own technologies in our factories. Um, you will see this later in uh, one little example. So Siemens is doing a lot of things. Uh, everyone knows Siemens for uh, its uh, product delivery in the industry, so for motors, for PLCs, computers, and so on. Uh, what not everybody knows is that we are investing a lot of money, kind of 6 billion euros per year, in digitalization and new technologies. Um, why? Uh, because the uh, market is asking for that. And especially uh, our consumers, so ourselves in principle, are uh, setting the market expectations. We are individuals, we are everyone different from the other. And so we want individual products, customized products. We want to have those products very fast. So the time to market, so the time between the idea and the, uh, the realization of the product or delivery of the product should be as short as possible. We want the high quality and fast delivery. So we want the nice products offered very fast to our uh, home, to our house. And of course, we want to have uh, sustainable products, healthy products. Everyone is looking for that now. And if those products are food or pharmaceutical products, we also want to know everything about their origin. So these and many others, uh, many other uh, requirements are coming daily on our tables from, uh, uh, from our customers and partners. And uh, what is the answer from our perspective to these uh, challenges? In few words, is uh, a combination of what we call a real world with a virtual world. The real world is what we already know since many years. The automations within uh, the manufacturing companies is made by uh, machine working, uh, motors, uh, sensors, networks, and so on. What is physical? Um, on the other end, we have the virtual world, which is something which happens within a computer. So it's the, the world of software, of design, of uh, uh, simulation the cloud, the artificial intelligence, all this stuff um, until a few years back was developing on different uh, um, environment. We had different companies taking care of uh, those two different worlds. Since uh, uh, 10 years, I would say, uh, Siemens is putting together those two ideas because we see a benefit uh, in the combination of the, what is virtual and what is real. And uh, how does that work? Uh, first of all, we have to say that this is an approach that we uh, see uh, working for all kinds of companies, uh, or industrial companies, uh, I mean, uh, so starting from process companies, for example, food or chemicals, up to discrete companies, for example, automotive or uh, air, um, assembly companies and so on together with, of course, uh, industrial communication and industrial security uh, um, requirements that are always uh, um, a part of our, uh, of our discussions. And then basically the idea is to address um, the entire life cycle of our products, whatever the product is, it might be a car, an aircraft, a bottle of beer. First of all, we want to design this product, uh, simulate and verify its behavior, which might be a physical behavior, a chemical behavior, or whatever is, is needed to simulate in order to make sure that the product you are designing will fulfill the expectations uh, of, your, uh, of your customer. And this is done basically with a number of different kinds of softwares. Uh, you probably have seen one of those software in uh, Mr. Rauch's presentation. It was one of our simulation systems, which is uh, simulating the behavior um, of not only a product, I would say, uh, but also uh, a production line, because uh, the second step would be not only simulate the product, but also the plant uh, or the machine or the production uh, uh, facility, which is producing uh, those goods. And this is of utmost importance to also um, study and understand how it works, because uh, it's part of your production uh, um, performance. You want to know if your machine is able to perform a number of pieces per hour, for example, or if, if the logistics of your production cell, of your robots, or of your plant are uh, really uh, capable of offering uh, such a performance. So you want to simulate 
um, also this kind of behavior, the production um, plant against the product. If you are able to carry out uh, uh, those steps in a simulation environment, so totally uh, via software, then your life will be much more easy when you build up your machine, your product, your plant. Build up means to transform your design, your project into steel, copper, silicon, electronics, whatever is needed to make something working, a real machine, a real production line. And if you do so, then you are enabled to do a kind of, uh, what we call it uh, virtual commissioning. So the capability to uh, try, put to the test your product or your machine or your plant, uh, connecting the machine to a real controller um, and find out if uh, your design was properly done, if there are any bottlenecks or any design errors, both, both from the point of view of the mechanics, uh, but also from the point of view of uh, software and the logical behavior of what you are producing. And last but not least, once your plant or machine is uh, up and running, uh, it's producing uh, goods, but it's also producing uh, a lot of data. We all know that the data is uh, uh, really uh, uh, important to uh, collect and process in order to get um, information out of those data. And this can be done with a number of technologies. We have been talking many times about uh, uh, cloud computing, but also about artificial intelligence all technologies which are related to data processing, which is really uh, the key. Also because uh, the result of this processing is very useful in order to close the loop, in order to make a better design the next time we design the product, for example, or a better design the next time we make a new production line. Using those data, we are able also to do this kind of uh, improvements in our, in our um, product lifecycle management. This is not happening just thank you to technology by itself, but of course, this must be supported by consulting, uh, implementation support, uh, and so on. And this we uh, offer uh, every day to our, uh, to our customers. And the experience we are doing with those customers is very useful for us to support um, companies who are um, planning to change, planning to do a digital transformation inside their own uh, facilities, which is not um, very easy very many times. So what you see up, up to now, uh, it's not the future in our, in our perspective, but it's already the present. This is already happening in, uh, in a lot of companies, not only big companies, I have to say, also in small companies. And because I work in Italy, in a lot of uh, small uh, or mid-sized Italian companies, um, but what is uh, uh, waiting for us in the next uh, two, three, four years? Where is uh, uh, Siemens looking at as uh, new uh, cutting edge technologies for the next years? There are a bunch of these technologies that I have listed here. Uh, for time reasons, we do not have the time to go through all of them, but I would like to uh, address a couple of uh, these technologies with a couple of examples, just to show you uh, that uh, um, they have very practical uh, um, uh, consequences in our in our production facilities, and I will start uh, with uh, uh, this example. Uh, we are talking about uh, additive manufacturing and generative design together. Um, what, what do we mean with this? Um, generative design is the capability of a software system uh, to design products given a number of constraints and rules. In this case, what you see is a, a system exploring the entire space of possibility when designing a gas burner. On the right, you see here a gas burner compared with the conventional design gas burner made by a human. The result is a, a, a very uh, performing uh, component able to save uh, material, able to save uh, uh, time for production because uh, it has uh, less parts that need to be assembled and uh, also uh, saving money uh, when uh, manufacturing this product. 
Of course, this goes together with the 3D printing because uh, once you design such kind of uh, uh, complex product, you are not able to produce it with the traditional uh, tool machine work, but you needed to use a, a, a 3D printer process to do so. Uh, by the way, pretty interesting thing is that uh, I am always impressed that uh, this thing, this burner, looks like very much a kind of biological piece or human heart at the end of the day, which is uh, kind of cool. So second example, um, this is an application that we developed recently. And it's, uh, uh, at the moment, it's up and running in our facility, uh, production facility in Hamburg, in Germany. Uh, as I said, the Siemens is uh, our first customer, I would say. Uh, not an easy customer, by the way. Um, and uh, we use uh, our technology to produce technology. And uh, this example is about using artificial intelligence to um, fix a bottleneck that we had, uh, we recently had in our production uh, facility. So I try to put it in a very easy. Uh, we have a production line where we make uh, uh, PLCs. So meaning we are producing uh, electronic boards uh, with electronic components on board that will be assembled uh, and then shipped to our, to our customers. This is a very complex process, which is totally automated, but uh, and, and very efficient, by the way. Um, but uh, there was a bottleneck that every single piece coming out of this production line in the past had to be uh, inspected with an X-ray machine, which is the last machine you see on the right. And this machine is also a bottleneck because it was too slow in order to uh, keep up with the performance that were uh, requested to the production line. So we had to find out a solution for that. A uh, very easy solution would be make it double, so buy another machine. Uh, but uh, we decided to try to make the line just more intelligent. So the project was about collecting um, collecting data from, from the production line uh, to train an artificial uh, intelligence engine, a neural network uh, to, be, to be precise, uh, in order to find out if a single piece coming out from this line was really needing to go into the X-ray or not. Because we found that not all the pieces uh, were presenting defects that were uh, able to be detected by the X-ray. So in other words, at the end of this production line, this artificial intelligence, which is uh, working uh, both locally and both on the cloud, was able to say, yes, please go to the X-ray or no, don't go there, it's not necessary. Uh, the result of this project was pretty interesting because uh, yes, we saved a lot of uh, uh, tests because 30% less test we have done in the X-ray machine, but uh, the quality rate of the line was uh, uh, preserved. So 100% uh, um, successful uh, quality tests were done, just like before when we were testing every single piece coming out from this line. It of course, we saved a lot of money because um, we were not uh, obliged to buy a new machine, and the cost of this new machine was kind of half a million euros. Um, and so very, you know, very uh, easy way to save money because the investment here was uh, about a few, th few tens thousand euros compared with the 500 investment required for doubling the machine. So is this is correct? an example. Thank you yeah. very much for your presentation. I think we will have to conclude on this slide at the moment. Okay. And I briefly before we uh, summarize this, the whole session, I just would like to ask a question because we may have in our audience a company, representative of a company, of a small uh, manufacturing company that would be interested to approach digital transformation projects. So where should they start? What would be your advice? Yeah, um, th there is no one size fits all, I have to say. There is no recipe which is valid for anyone. But if I should give some advice, I would say, uh, think big and start small. So you have to have a vision what, where we, you want to go, 
but you have to start with small projects uh, in order to be successful and uh, and kind of design your path across the transformation. Secondly, it's uh, of utmost importance to have uh, the commitment of the management within the company. It's not just about buying a new 3D printer or a new robot or a new piece of software and you have done your transformation. No, there are some organizational impacts that you have to manage and uh, to support within your company. So the management uh, commitment is, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, very important in order to be successful in this direction. Thank you very much for your advice. You're welcome. And so if we look today on what has been said uh, in this panel session, uh, I, I think we may put together the following observations. It's clear that SMEs are eager to have in place instruments and tools like Industry 4.0 assessment or an Industry 4.0 roadmap as presented by Mr. Erwin Rauch. The projects are investigating the topic of Industry 4.0 and they bring to the early stage researchers high chance to develop their career and move to appealing jobs, as mentioned Professor Lisa de Propis. Professor Anlor mentioned, said that research translation is a powerful concept, not yet fully understood, and which takes various forms and extends according to the context industry it's applied to. And finally, from uh, Giuseppe, representative of the industry uh, of the company Siemens, that is very important in EU funded project as a partner, as a beneficiary, and as a very important collaborator uh, with uh, academia and also research institutions. He says that in order to create a maximum benefit, the digital transformation needs to be approached with a holistic view addressing the full product life cycle. With that said, I would like to thank to all speakers today for their input and for sharing their experience from managing EU funded projects. And before closing the session, I actually would like to draw your attention to the next European Union research and innovation program called Horizon Europe. As you may know, the current research and innovation staff exchange scheme will continue in Horizon Europe under the same pillar, excellent science, but it will change its name to staff exchange. Starting in 2021, the Horizon Europe will allow for next year's seven years financing uh, new research collaborations open to both academia and businesses, open to European countries, as well as countries in all over the continents in the world. And therefore, I wish all potential applicants good luck with the preparations of new innovative project proposals. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, please enjoy upcoming SOF sessions where you will have other chance to meet our RISE project coordinators because at the end of conference, in total, 19 Marie Skodowska key reaction projects are presented in panels across all different panels. And for example, today at six o'clock, there will be a panel, ethical artificial intelligence with and for the people. Under the S of team, I compute, therefore I am. So I would like to thank you very much once again. And before we finally conclude, I will give the floor to every speaker just to say one final sentence to use it as a goodbye message. Erwin, please. Thank you, Simona. So my message would be that companies that try to introduce new technologies, they should, as said before also by Giuseppe, think big and start uh, small, therefore with pilot actions and with the methods that we provided in our project. Thank, Thank you. you. Lisa? I think my kind of uh, sound bite would be collaborate. Collaborate, network, uh, resources the firms need are more likely to be outside uh, themselves. So collaboration and networking is gonna be absolutely crucial. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anlor, 
Well, I can only echo that, uh, collaborate and, and design your research with, with purpose, with meaning and intent in order to be able to achieve an impact and, and really contribute to society. And finally, Giuseppe. Oh yes, my message would be, be courageous. Don't be shy, try your technology and uh, with a purpose, of course, and, and uh, you'll see you'll be successful. Good luck. Thank you very much.